everyone. This is Steve Marinucci, freelance writer for Billboard, Variety, Hollywood Reporter, Access.com, Goldmine, and I don't know, you name it, I'm there. Welcoming you to another edition of Things We Said Today, our weekly topical look at the Beatles past, present, and to come. Let me uh, introduce my two cohorts in crime um, on the East Coast, uh, first in the state of Maine, where I'm jealous he has all the lobsters and we don't, um, Mr. Alan Cosen, the author of The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop, got that something, how the Beatles want to hold your hand changed everything, and the former master of the Beatles desk at the New York Times, and someday we have to have a show about that. Welcome. Hello, Alan. Hey, Steve. Hello, everyone. I'll send you some lobsters if you want. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Okay, from the great state of Connecticut. Um, well, I, I, I'm trying to think of some good things about Connecticut. It's been a long time since I've been there. It's a nutmeg um, steak. It's the nutmeg steak. There we go. And it's um, the home of Pez. It's the home of Pez. Is it really the home of Pez? Yes, this is where Pez started. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. The host of the Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing, uh, Mr. Ken Michaels. Hello, Ken. Hi, Steve. Hi, everybody. This week, we are going to talk about the Beatles uh, Magical Mystery Tour movie and CD. But we're, first, we're going to get into a little bit of news. I guess the big news this week was Ringo making a change to uh, two changes to the All Star Band. He dropped uh, Todd Rundgren and Richard Page, and he's bringing on board Graham Goldman and Colin Hay. Colin Hay, of course, has been there before, but Graham Goldman is new to the to the band. And we were talking about what he would play, and I think the likelihood is probably uh, "I'm Not in Love" and um, well, "Things We Do for Love." Is that is that right. what we? Okay. Um, but he also has written a lot of songs, and we were and we just went through the list. He wrote um, "For Your Wrote For Your Love." He wrote "No Milk Today" for Herman's Hermits. So listen there are people listen, listen people, and also for Herman's Hermits. Yeah, there's a Heart lot. Full of soul. <laughs> full soul, right? He could do a lot of those, but I think the uh, given the uh, formula of the All Star Band, he'll probably do he'll do uh, I'm Not in Love, and uh, you know he'll do 10 CC songs. But it sure, would be nice if he did a couple of those songs he wrote. That would be yeah. kind of cool. What do you guys think about uh, Goldman and Colin Hay? Alan, um, Alan. Well, I like Grand Goldman. I'm in in you know both as a composer of a lot of classic rock songs and in his work in 10 CC. Um, I've never seen him perform. So, um, you know, I, I have no expectations there, but I, I think, you know, given, given his history and his catalog, I think he'd be a great addition to the band and, you know, and something new for them because it's been pretty much the same lineup for quite a while now. Um, yeah. and, uh, Colin Hay has been in it before. And, um, I think, uh, Men at Work's big hits are receding <laughs> quickly into the mists of time, but they were, you know, I, I liked them when they were out, and um, I, I think it, it probably will be, uh, you know, a, a, a nice addition, you know, to have him back, uh, you know, just change the set list a bit and, you know, juggle things around, and that looks good to me. Yeah, I, I didn't look to see if uh, Hay was had played um, Europe before. Goldman has not played the U.S., so it'll be interesting to see if, when Ringo tours the U.S. next time, if Goldman is with him. But, Ken, do you have any thoughts? Uh, first of all, uh, Colin Hay, I thought, was great in uh, the All-Star Band. He was actually in two different lineups. And I think those songs, some men at work, I wouldn't say they're receding <laughs> into the past. There, I think that they work very well as live songs. And uh, the people who grew up in that time especially certainly remember them. Who could it be now and Down Under and Overkill, which was a top ten hit, and that's a great song too. Um, I think it works very well in the all-star band format. They're just great live songs. And uh, Graham Goldman is, an, is a nice change right there. He's not someone that I figured would be. You know, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of artists from the 60s through the 80s that I can still come up with that I think uh, would make nice additions who have never been in the All-Star mm -hmm. Band. But I, I like didn't Paul. think of... The <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I, still, I still like the idea, and, and I hit him with this 
a few years ago of having Mickey Dolenz in there. I think Mickey Dolenz would be fantastic. But um, apparently that's not going to happen because uh, I asked Mickey in an interview if he would be interested, and he, he said yes, but he hasn't. they haven't done it. So. Mm. There's still a lot of worthwhile performers and artists who who would fit very well in the all-star band format. Sure. And um, maybe sometime in the future we should do a show on who we'd like to see in the all-stars. But it's nice to see some change here because, um, you know, like you said, it's been five or six years with the same members. And there hasn't been that much of a change in the set list period aside from the ones that Ringo has done, his newer songs at the time. You know, you mm-hmm. go back to, uh, well, Greg Raleigh was doing Everybody's Everything, the Santana song. That changed to Oye Como Va. But um, for the most part, uh, Todd Rundgren changed from Hello, It's Me into Love is the Answer. But otherwise, it's pretty much the same songs in every single show. And mm-hmm. so when you've got very talented people like that with really great catalogs, you could change it up a bit. And certainly in the case of Ringo, well, you know how I feel about that. I wish he would, you know, pick some other songs from his solo career that he's never done live before. And, you know, certainly with the new album, Give More Love, he started to um, do the title track at a few shows in Las Vegas. And then he stopped and he didn't do anything from uh, from Give More Love for the rest of the tour, which is a shame. But um Really, and, and that, that's hard to understand. I mean, if you're promoting an album, why stop doing any songs from the CD? Especially, I mean, there were some strong songs on that, as we said. There were some very strong songs on that disc. And to stop doing them completely just is well, he's, completely illogical. He could be following mm. Beatles' precedent on Revolver. <laughs> you know, they didn't play anything from Revolver, and it sold pretty well. <laughs> well, that's true too. Except I don't see I don't see uh, give more love uh, all over the charts. Just, mm. You know. So, but the one thing that I'm baffled by is the song "We're on the Road Again." It's all about going on the road with your band. He wrote the song with Steve Lukather. Steve is in the band. <laughs> I can't just can't believe that they didn't pull that one out. You yeah, know, one song I mean, for the new album, and it's a great rock song. That was he a really no, that have was, done that. That was a no brainer. I mean we, we you know, we said that when we were when we were talking about it. It was I mean, it was an absolute no brainer and I don't know. Sometimes you have to wonder, you know, what thought processes go into the, into you know, into the way he sets up the set list. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Mm. Anyway. Okay. Uh and then Ken, you saw the last two shows on the tour here in the U.S., correct? Right, right. At the Beacon Theater in New York and also in Newark, New Jersey. The New, New Jersey. Jersey. New Jersey. <laughs> Where the New stars Jersey. shine. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, they were great shows. They're like all the other shows I've seen from Ringo. And um, this is a stellar band. There's no doubt about it. It's mm-hmm. like I've said time and time again. I've loved all the bands that Ringo's put together. I think there's a difference here because of the fact that Ringo genuinely loves these guys. He loves them as friends, and they get along really well. And I feel like it's not just a group of great musicians. They're really good friends. And at this point, when you've been together this long, granted it's only one to two months at a time, but several tours over five years, you kind of become a family. And I think that Ringo misses that. He misses having a band uh, of his own, whether it's this or for a time he had the Roundheads in the studio and i think he missed that aspect of closeness with the same people but now he's broken he's broken that family so Mm. to speak with the addition of goldman and hay and you have to wonder number one i mean i always thought that and i always felt especially the way they related on stage that rundgren was a very integral part of that Uh, he was almost the band leader Outside or the musical, not the musical director, because that was um, uh, that wasn't him. But I mean, he was a very integral part of that group, and that now he's not there anymore. And you've got Goldman and Hay. I'm guessing Greg Raleigh is going to take the you know kind of the the front end you know leadership kind of role on stage of the of the of the stars of the all stars. But um, yes, I mean it 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 does have kind of a. a a shift in the in the all-star band and um 
You know, well, I don't, I don't know who would be the, the so-called uh, leader there. I mean, Ringo is the leader, but they all have a presence on stage, and they all do introductions, and they all give you the feeling that they're, you know, that this is a, a love fest, as right. they put it, yeah. on stage. And, yeah, some, uh, sometimes it gets a little too lovey, but yeah, it, it is. It, it, I mean, there's no question that they all like each other. At least that's the way they make it seem. But um, – I think, if anything, I think Todd, when Steve, Steve said leader, he meant you know more like Mark Rivera used to do at the beginning of this, you know, someone to just sort of keep all the musical stuff together, whether Ringo's on stage or off, you know. Mm. Well, uh, Ham and Warren Ham actually took over that role, and and he still, to a certain extent, continued that. But it seemed to me that when I saw the couple of times I saw Ringo with Rundgren. Or the, I should say, few times because it was more than two, more than a couple. Rundgren had a very kind of direct part in the way the show went, and now Rundgren's not going to be there. And you, and I'm wondering, you know, who's going to going to be that person? And I'm, my guess is Greg Raleigh. Mm. I, I don't, I don't think I agree with what you were saying there. I think that he's just he's such a big part of the band. And Todd has a great presence on stage, and he talks a lot, and he ad-libs a lot, and he dances around the stage more than anybody else in that group. Mm -hmm. But as far as like the set list and how everything is paced, that's all pretty much decided beforehand. And you know, Mark Rivera was doing that, and probably Warren Ham just took up the mantle and just continuing what Mark did. So, Alan, yeah, I think there's also. I mean, do we know that? That they're not coming back, say, in another leg of the tour or the next tour. Um, or we're, we're we're talking as if um, Ringo decided to make the change, but it could be that those two just weren't available for those dates, and and maybe back later. I mean, do we know anything about that? No, we don't. We don't. Um, there's nothing. Uh, I mean, there was no reasons given or anything, so we don't know anything. You know, beyond the fact that they aren't going to be on this on this part of the tour. For all we know, they could rejoin. You know, the next time they come back to the U.S., I, mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. That could always happen. That could always happen. I know right. that uh, Ringo loves Todd. He really loves Todd a lot. So I'm sure any time that Todd wants to be in the group, he can be. But I know at this particular time in the tour, he's got something else planned. And it is kind of interesting that um, they're doing a couple of dates in Israel. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, um, but this, the last two shows that I saw were phenomenal. They've always been that way. I think the group really shines in particular with the Santana songs and the Toto songs when there's a lot of jamming on stage. Mm -hmm. You really see the guitar chops of Steve Lukather, who's one of the great guitar players of today. He may not be the household name of an Eric Clapton, for example, but, um, you know, man, that guy can play. And uh, Greg Raleigh too on the keyboards. Let me and, let me re let me revise what I said. I think the the band actually stands on both Luke Luther and Greg Raleigh. I think R Raleigh uh, Raleigh kind of sticks out in my head because of the way he furiously plays during those Santana songs. But you're right, Luke Luther is really a, a good part of that, a great part of that band too. So I mm -hmm. and but uh, you know and also I, I could say that. You know, I don't follow everyone's schedule in that band, but I know that Todd is always touring. He mm -hmm. does a few tours, different tours in a year. So it's not always easy to accommodate everybody, you know, to work around Ringo's schedule or, you know, Ringo and Todd have to coordinate that together. So it just so happens at this particular time that Todd isn't available. So Right. Okay. Um, next, we're going to talk about actually a piece of news that broke today. That Pete Best is going to play himself uh, for three uh, engagements, for three day, I should say, for three shows in a play that will open in Liverpool at the Epstein Theater in the spring. The play is called uh, Lennon's Banjo, adapted from uh, a novel called Julia's Banjo, regarding the fact that John Lennon uh, learned to first play banjo, and this is the hunt for that banjo based on the novel that's, that that uh, has a, a tour guide, a fictional Beatles tour guide, and I wonder who the fictional Beatles tour guide was based upon, since I know a few Liverpool Beatles tour guides there, and they're, and they're probably listening. 
uh, who finds a, uh, a letter written by John Lennon that provides a clue to its whereabouts, and everybody wants to find it because it's a, a hot piece of memorabilia. So that's going to be interesting, and, and uh, Pete's going to be in three of those shows. It's, a, it's his acting debut, which will be interesting uh, on its own. Um, mm. <laughs> any any com- any comments about that? Too easy. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'd be really curious to see how well he does as an actor and how many lines he gets too. I'm uh, I'm wondering, and, and the the information I got didn't say was whether or not uh, he's being written into the show, or he is in the show. You know, the the novel has him in it. Oh, I guess it actually it does. I'm looking at his, at, at Pete's quote. And he said, uh, "I said in passing, I should play me." So apparently, he is in in the in the story, uh, and so that's uh, interesting. Um, but anyway, but the, it it will be from uh, April twenty fourth through May fifth, and Pete's um, dates are April twenty fifth and May fifth, and he will play two shows on April twenty fifth and one on May fifth. So there we go. Seems, uh, okay. seems seems hardly worth learning a role for three performances. Yeah. Well, he said he said he has other other uh, uh, dates or other things going on. He can't do all the, the whole run. Uh, That's why he didn't do it. So hmm. anyway, and I and I, I'm guessing that his role his role is not that big. Uh, that would be my guess, but I don't know. But in any event, so he uh, walks um, walks along a road and he meets this kid who's cutting school and they roll a tire down the hill and then the kid sees <laughs> his friends. <laughs> okay, sorry. Uh, anyway, anyway, we have some viewer mail. Um, we picked a couple of a few uh, letters that we uh, or uh, emails that we got this week, and uh, first uh, on the on the YouTube page from Call It How I See It. He said, haven't you guys got the means to burn a CD? Stop obsessing over releases. It's a drag, a well-known drag. Go through their songs one by one. Devote a show to each. Explore the music up close. There's 200 shows for you right there. I look forward to the show. But you spend so much time on their beige, beige patches apart. Focus on what made them great. The songs, not the lousy marketing and hangers on. I am not sure... That's an interesting comment. Any any uh, anybody want to comment on that? Uh, I certainly would <laughs> like to. Go ahead. Uh, you know, we do a lot here on the news. The news is a big part of the show. So if there are new releases coming out, we want to comment about it. And this is strictly the way that we feel, and we're not telling you to feel exactly the way that we feel as well. But um, we are concerned about what gets released and whether or not it's being done properly. This is the legacy of the Beatles that we're concerned about here so whether we want to comment about vinyl or downloads or colored vinyl or whatever else this is just how we feel we're not telling you to feel the same way you know and i do think that um you know the way that the beatles are handled by the record company in particular you know this is all very important we want the beatles legacy to always endure and it's not something that i take for granted i don't just assume that no matter what 50 years from now, people are still going to be talking about them. I think the way that their legacy is handled has a lot to do with it. And as far as the comment about 200 shows, uh, I don't think that most listeners would be that fascinated with shows dedicated to one song in each show to talk for an hour about one particular song. That's going on a bit too long about songs in particular. Maybe a few of them are worth an hour. And then you've got all the solo music, too. Which really and truly, when you take a look at the entire output of these four people, accounts for 80% of their output. So to only uh, talk about 200 songs and, and one part of their, their history is wrong. So that's what I have to say about that. I do think it's important to talk about what's in the news and how we feel about it. Well, I mean, I, I mean, I, you know, having done, you know, you know, criticism of the Beatles outside of the show. I mean, I, you know, I'm, there's a way that I'm going to, I'm going to look at things and I'm speaking for myself only here. You know, there's a way I'm going to look at things and I'm not always going to be agreeable with everything they do. And, and, um, you know, that's part of what the show is about. You know, we have our opinions and, um, while, you know, my opinion may not agree with yours, 
that's what it is. Uh, so that's that's about it. Uh, Alan, uh, what do you want to say? Uh, well, I, I think the two of you have um, largely um, um, handled it apart. The only thing I disagree with that um, Ken says is that I, I, of course, feel that everybody should feel exactly the same way I feel because the way I feel is, is the most logical way to feel. So, uh, <laughs> and not to mention that I'm so persuasive. So, oh, okay. Thank no, you. But, no, but really, I mean, we don't even all agree among ourselves. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you know uh, – Obviously, look, we, we, we talk about an awful lot of stuff on the show. I'm not sure that we could sustain an hour on every single song. Strawberry Fields, maybe, Cambridge 69, uh, you know. Certain, <laughs> but, uh, yes, yes. But, you know, not everyone. I mean, uh, an hour on Wild Honey Pie, I'm not sure we can do it. But, mm. you know, we, we'll keep it in mind. Maybe there are some songs we can we can sort of separate out that are worth – uh, that we think we can sustain an hour on, but um, thanks for the suggestion. Mm. Okay. okay. Um, <laughs> well, or were you going to say something else, Ken? Yeah, I just think that when you're talking about music or art of any kind, when we're talking about our likes and dislikes, it really is opinion. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not fact, and I don't expect everyone in the world to agree with me or the two of you. We're just sharing our opinions. They're right. just educated opinions, that's all. And um, nobody knows everything there is to know about the Beatles, as Mark Lewison said, not even him. So, um, you know, when it, when it comes to the art itself, what we're sharing is basically our own feelings about it. And, you know, I care about what everybody has to say when it comes to opinions. But the people who study it the most are the ones whose opinions I respect the most. Okay. That's all. Um, we got two, two comments um, that I'm going to – point up from uh, from our discussion about the release of the Beatles Christmas uh, records which by the way the the promos ha- the the promos have been or the downloads have been sent out and um, I will say that uh, so far there's been no changes there's been no editing I know a lot of people had asked me if uh, there were things that had been edited out um, that might seem a little um, non politically correct. No, everything is in. The difference, and Alan uh, yeah, agreed with me when we were talking about this before the show, is that the at least the the versions we got were a little softer and not as bright as some of the bootlegs. But it may be just for promotional sake that we got these things and that, that any actual release or the release on vinyl might be different. Um, no, but in I, any know, way, I don't know, Steve. They sent us wave files. It wasn't even like it was just MP3. So that's true. That's the, true too. That's true too. Yeah. That's that's very true. Yeah. But in any event, um, one of the uh, the repliers was uh, our friend Norman Masloff, co-author of that great book, The Beatles England, way back when. Uh, and uh, salute to Norman for that wonderful book. He said part of what he said was this: in regards to the Christmas final set, there are lots of new young record collectors will jump on this box. They are into the physical stuff again and have no use for CDs. Yeah, a download would be great too, but I bet they'll wait until next year. Get to the collectors first who want identical reproductions, although vinyls instead of flexis. And agreeing with him was an old friend, um, Al Sussman. Remember Al Sussman, folks? He's oh. back. <laughs> Hello, Al. Uh, and and, and, and uh Al uh, posted on my Beatles News and Information page. He said, Steve, I'm with Norman on this. It's a boutique release aimed at collectors who may never have gotten the original Flexies and would like vinyl copies that are more playable than the Flexies. And how would a CD release be a huge seller? Again, I'm, I, I think that the CD release would have gotten a lot more airplay among mass market stations. Not all of the, the messages, but maybe the first couple. But you know, we'll never know, at least not yet, uh, assuming that there is not going to be a, a disc release for a while, uh, apparently. So, uh, Alan, did Well, you know, in terms you- of airplay, which um, means nothing particularly to me, but I know it's a, a big thing for you two, um, it, it seems very likely to me that Universal could service radio stations with the wave files like they did with uh, print critics, and they mm-hmm. could burn a CD and they could play the CD. I, I doubt they'll be played much on the air. I mean, they're they're spoken mostly, and um, the ones that aren't just spoken that have skits, 
get really, you know, a bit longer than um, than I think radio stations like to spend on something like this that isn't a hit song. So in terms of airplay, I mean, I, I don't know, and frankly, I don't care. What I hadn't realized until right now, this discussion was that apparently you could only do it either on vinyl or on CD, because... You know, that's that's what Norman Maslow's response seems to be saying mm-hmm. to me. You know, well, then you do it on vinyl. I mean, well, okay, fine for the people who want, um, you know, something like a replica of the original things. I mean, I'm getting them on vinyl, and I'm, I'm, I'll be happy to have them on vinyl. I think it's a, a cool little box of stuff. But, mm-hmm. you know, for everyday kick-around playing and stuff like that, I, I kind of would have thought... CD makes more sense or downloads or whatever, because even though vinyl is making a resurgence and a lot of people have vinyl, an awful lot more, a lo- an awful lot more people don't have vinyl and don't have the capability right. to play vinyl. So it, it just seems to me that, I mean, just as a marketing thing, sorry, call it as I hear it. <laughs> it 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 makes sense to do it in all formats, not just one format that is, you know, possibly still a minority format. Right, which which made me it would, it, when I got the downloads, first thing I thought of was maybe they're going to throw this on iTunes. Yeah. So that's I I don't know. Uh, it's it's possible. We haven't heard. There hasn't been any. There hasn't been any word that they will do that, but. Who knows? Mm, uh, I just think it should be as accessible as possible. Yeah, that's all that we're saying. The more accessible it is, the more people are likely to get it. You know, mm-hmm. this whole and, thing about formats. Years and years ago, when the internet was just starting, at, at the New York Times, we had a, a big, you know, whole staff meeting with the publisher. Um, Arthur Sulzberger Jr. And he said, you know, all this stuff about, you know, whether the print newspaper is going to go away, whether it's going to be on the Internet or whatever. He said, I am format agnostic. If I could beam the paper directly to your, um, you know, uh, to your to your brain, I would do it. And I kind of feel that way, too. You know, it's great to have them on the little on little vinyl singles, but. You know, put them out in every way people can get them. Why not? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I do think it's it's interesting what Norman said about young people into vinyl now. And if they're discovering the Beatles through vinyl first, then that's fantastic. I just can't I can't picture young Beatle fans, new Beatle fans discovering the Beatles Christmas messages through a box set of vinyl singles. I just I don't know. I don't see it. I could be wrong, you know, but. Or if they want well, to discover it that way, I don't see them saying, well, okay, but now I'm not going to discover it this way because it's also out on CD. Mm-hmm. You know? They want to discover it that way, fine. Let them. Mm. Maybe we just kind of found the answer to the question that maybe they will throw it on iTunes. Well, I don't ha- know. They haven't announced that they will. And, you no, know, they have the not. Holidays, as of, as are, of- holidays are coming um, pretty quickly, so you would think that they might want to get this info out if they were going to do it, which makes me conclude they're not going to do it. I could be wrong, but it doesn't look like they're going to do it. Well, the, the release of the vinyl today, the, we're taping this on the 4th. The release of the vinyl is um, the 15th. So yeah. 11 days. So they still have time to announce it. So we'll see. That was good timing because you can go buy your copy of the box set on your way to see the new Star Wars film. There you go. Yeah. There, there you go. There you go. Anyway, okay. Uh, and one more mo- real minor piece of news. Um, I uh, usually mention my Beatles News and Information group on Facebook. My newest member today, actually my two newest members today are Pete Best and Rogue Best. Pete actually joined the group on his own. I didn't drag him in at, uh, on Facebook. You can bring members in. Um, I did not. He asked to join, which I was more than happy to, ha- to have him in. So anybody, if you're looking to join my group, uh, Pete is now a member. Anyway, all right. All right. Let's can I mention into- one thing? Yes, one, you may. One very Go. small bit of news. Go. And this is uh, thanks to one of our listeners, Bruce Muni, mm-hmm. that uh, we were mentioning all this colored vinyl on our last show. Ringo's Bad Boy album just was reissued on colored vinyl mm-hmm. and um it's on the friday music label 
Huh. Okay, so okay. you could try and hunt that down for those who are into colored vinyl. Okay. All right. Anyway, we're going to talk about Magical Mystery Tour, the CD, and the movie. And I remember the last time we had this discussion, it was around the time the the Blu-ray and the DVD were released. And it was an interesting discussion. But um, I'm going to start, and I'm going to say... It's been how long since the, how long since the uh, the DVD came out? Two years, maybe. I think it's two. Uh, it's two years, and I think and one of the things. No, it's that, way more than that. Two years ago was the One Plus. All right, I'm looking. Okay. I got the box set in front of me. It's 2012. Uh, okay. Yeah, so that's okay. five years. Five years. All right. Wow. So so the so the it's, the DVD came out. The DVD and Blu-ray came out five years ago, and the idea to remaster the the movie in the best possible quality was to make it uh, to up its standing historically because it had been critically savaged i guess is the good word is a word for it and at the time 5 years ago it was just you and me can i believe yes <laughs> and we had a very strong disagreement on what the release accomplished. You thought it, it helped. I said it did not. Now, here we are five years later. And in my view, nothing has happened since. It has not gone anywhere. Magical Mystery Tour is still the, uh, pa- you know, passed over. I, I don't mean to say, but I mean, it's still the one of the uh, lesser thought of projects of the Beatles. Except, I mean, there's some good music in it. And there's a couple of good moments, but overall, the film itself does not rank highly in terms of, you know, the successes of sex, success stories of the Beatles, in my view. Mm-hmm. Um, let's. I'm going to start with you, and then we'll go to Alan. But I, you can respond. Well, you know, you might be right about in the last five years, maybe. Uh, wait a minute, wait a minute, been... wait a minute. Did you say no. I was right? Did you say I was right? I, 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 we, you we have to, to wait till I finish everything. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> you, you might be right in that the last five years there hasn't been a growing appreciation of the film. But like I said, we have no idea in the future how people are going to be looking at this. And the way that I – and probably I said the same thing when we talked about this many years back. The great thing about the Beatles' five films is that they're all different from each other. And they're all different in many, in many ways. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, Magical Mystery Tour was a free-form project. It was mainly improvised. And you compare that to something more structured, like A Hard Day's Night in Help, and it's very different. But some people may prefer that kind of film. You know, it's, you shouldn't just assume that everybody thinks that it's the worst, because you have no idea sometimes until, let's just say, you survey young people. They may actually look at A Hard Day's Night in Help and think that it's kind of corny, and think that the trippy music and the way that the Beatles are presented – uh, in Magical Mystery Tour is more to their liking. Everybody's different, but I love the fact that you have that kind of variety within the Beatles to have all these different films. It's kind of ridiculous to make comparisons between them because they're different. You can't compare A Hard Day's Night to Let It Be. They're different films. And Magical Mystery Tour, you know, there are some really good moments in it. Now, the thing is, since I love the Beatles so much, sometimes the fact that it's the Beatles overrides everything else to the point where I still find it fascinating. You know, it's fascinating to watch them on screen. Mm -hmm. And I love the fact that these, the skits in there uh, were largely improvised, mainly improvised. And um, so it's very different in that regard to Help and A Hard Day's Night. But kind of like those two movies, Help and A Hard Day's Night, it's kind of like watching a lot of music videos for each of the Beatles songs with, uh, you know, dialogue in between, you know, and then you've got the musical sequences, just like you did in the first two movies. It's just that it's... Magical Mystery Tour is very different. It's just... It's a wacky, loose, very British sense of humor, and I think a lot of fans weren't used to it. You know, in the very beginning, when Magical Mystery Tour came out and it was on British television, it was criticized in part because it, w- it was shown in black and white. 
I think, um, you know, that was a big problem in the very beginning. But I think, um, you know, over time, you, you have no idea how people may view more freeform films like this. The very fact that the Beatles were daring enough to go in this direction, and that's one of the things that we appreciate about the Beatles. It's just like, you know, Mark Lewison was talking about how they didn't want to duplicate themselves. Well, they didn't. <laughs> they didn't go in the same direction. They didn't do a rehash of A Hard Day's Night. They wanted to do something different. And this was completely different. You know, it was, so it, it was completely different, but it, it they were I mean, it was on the heels of Brian Epstein's death. And they were trying to, you know, they basically were striking out on their own for the first time, and and it was not successful. I mean, it, it got a lot of critical, uh, a lot of criticism. It it, I mean, the critics were all over it. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, again, for all of the effort that the DVD did to try and bring that back, or to try and change history it didn't i don't and, think it tried to change history you know these every every now and then they remastered the beatles films and they tried to do that with this the difference is they put it out on dvd and blu-ray and they packaged it nicely with a booklet and all and i think they did a great job with it but i don't think they're trying to change history by doing so oh you know, I, I, I think I, I absolutely think they were i i don't see how you can have any other opinion on that, uh, Alan? Come on in on this. Uh, I, I, I mean, just no. I'm, I, I want to hear. I want. I don't want this to go on too long okay. between you and me. Okay. I um, hear Alan's, well, you Alan's know, take. first of all, let me let me um, digress slightly and um, offer a geek's um, <laughs> view of the various what? releases of Magical Mystery Tour because the um, Blu-ray, while it looked really good was in some ways, like, it's not necessarily the preferred version. I think the preferred version is the 1988 Laserdisc. And one reason that the Blu-ray is not the preferred version is because one of the great things about the film, which is it gave us a different version of the theme song with, mm -hmm. uh, with a spoken thing from John uh, in the middle was replaced on the DVD with the standard album track. And that, to me, is kind of a big deal um, because I like all the differences that are available, right. and now suddenly it's not available. Um, do, you have, do you have any of the earlier versions? Yeah, I have them all. Okay. I mean, um, there's, there were a number of unauthorized versions that were easy to get. Yeah, I mean, I had, I mean, and I'm trying to remember. Did those have the 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 spoken? They did, didn't they? Yeah, mostly. I think the 1997 DVD did not. Uh, the Laserdisc in '88 did. The original uh, VHS and Betamax releases did have it. I mean, the actually that the original one. Although it looked very copied down and desperately needed color correction, is actually, I think, the only one where there was no tampering whatsoever. It, it is the film <laughs> as it was in 1967. There are a number of other, you know, small issues on the uh, the Blu-ray, like you know, in the beginning, in the bu you see the bus and you see these sort of stars falling down. They originally had put in these scratchy lines that are supposed to be like, you know, the trails of the stars coming down. And I guess whoever mm -hmm. remastered it decided that it was just scratchiness, and so they removed it. So that's gone. The stars are falling, but they're, you know, the little trails behind them aren't. I mean, that's not the end of the universe. Um, and it's right. not nearly as important as the, the title song being replaced. Um, in the 1988 one, I mean, we, we had a remix of the soundtrack by George Martin. Um, so the original soundtrack is there. I think that one does have the Lennon intro. And, um, you know, that, that one seems to be like, if you, if you really had to pick one, you would want that with some of the, um, color correction aspects of the Blu-ray. Although there were parts of the Blu-ray where the, the Beatles look kind of weirdly pink, you know? So the color correction was kind of inconsistent on that one. But, mm -hmm. um, but so that's that. I, I, I do think that Steve is 
Correct, insofar as they were hoping that a completely refreshed version would, you know, maybe not change history as such, but would make people reevaluate the film in a much more positive way. Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure that people have. Um, I mean, I, I kind—I mean, I can't count the number of times I've seen this. I know the first time I saw it, which was in the '70s. Um, I thought it was really kind of disappointing, um, except of course for the song clips, you know, I loved the songs <laughs> and you add all the song clips together. You're talking about a significant percentage of this film. Um, right. but all the stuff, what in- was, what was disappointing to you about it? Um, kind of aimless and, um, just sort of not as funny as perhaps it was hoped it would be and you know yeah it's a very british kind of humor but i mean at the time i was sort of you know steeped in monty python and i was used to british humor and i should point out that this was just as panned in england well it was mostly panned in england because it wasn't even shown here originally Mm -hmm. so you know Mm. they presumably over there are used to british humor so i'm not sure that that was a reason um these days, my feeling about Magical Mystery Tour and its defects really have to do with watching, uh, as I said a few weeks ago on the show, um, several hours worth of outtakes. And I really feel that if Paul McCartney could just sort of settle down for a few days in between tours and <laughs> revisit all the <laughs> original material, that he could make a far better Magical Mystery Tour than they did in 1967. You know, there, were, there was, there were, I think on the documentaries on the Blu-ray, they were talking about how rushed the editing was and, you know, and they weren't used to doing it. I kind of think that now if he were to take as much time as he needs and really revisit all the stuff that was cut out, maybe put in the scene with Jesse playing the drums dur- during the... Uh, Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, luncheon scene and and some of those other skits that people did during that, and maybe you know there were, there were a number of scenes that were even included in the Blu-ray as extras. I think if he were to sort of reconsider it and do a director's cut with all the songs, it would be a fantastic film. I mean, it would be still weird. It would still be a weird avant-garde film, but it would be much, much more interesting than the 1967 version. Now, that would be changing history, I mean, totally, but you would just think of it as, uh, you know, a different version of, you know, more of what was possible. Mm. I just know that when I watch it now, I I don't feel disappointed by it. I just look at it as as a different type of film. It is avant-garde and different for its time. Yeah. And how many bands were doing that kind of thing? Of course, the Beatles could afford to. Yeah. But, um, you know, they, they took a completely different approach. And I kind of admire them for it. And there's a lot of scenes in there. And it's, it's you know, it's mainly the music scenes. I love Fool on the Hill, mm-hmm. you know. And, right. um, you know, one of the things that I remember is back in the 80s when, when um, MTV was so big, they used to have their Beatle breaks. And um, they would take clips from their movies. And you realize that whether it's I Should Have Known Better or Another Girl or Fool on the Hill, they all work really well as just videos by themselves. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Fool on the Hill, to me, I love watching. Eye on the Walrus, I think, is classic. You know, I enjoy seeing those, those musical, I consider them videos. Blue Jay Way, Your Mother Should Know. It's kind of corny the way the the film ended with going down the staircase like that. But it you know, cool, it's a though. part of it. Was yeah, cool. I, I, it was I, cool like getting it. all dressed up in you know white tuxes and yeah, I, I kind of like that actually. Yeah. Not to you mention know it, that it, it fits you know, your mother should know kind of sound. You know, mm-hmm. uh huh. It's still the Beatles' creation and what they put into those moments visually is what they thought of, and I thought that it was very effective in that way. I was just going to say about your mother should know. You, you can just you can sense John would not have wanted to do that. <laughs> hmm. You know, to wear the white tux and go down the the stair. I just can't. You know, I could see him ridiculing that whole idea. But yeah, you know, oh, there's I don't, a lot I don't of know. I don't know. I mean, they might have at that point. They seem to be in a mood to do anything. 
Yeah. And 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 it's very likely that maybe Paul did suggest it, but John said, "Sure, let's you know, let's do something crazy like that." And uh, mm-hmm. you know, so. But I mean, there are and and there. Are, let me say that you're right. There are scenes in there, and that's one of the mother should know is one of them. There are some wonderful scenes in there, but taken overall, the movie, you know, the film just you know it, uh, it is aimless, as Alan said. I think that's that's a great great description. I, I'm going to have to. I'm not familiar with the outtakes you're talking about, Alan. I'm going to have to find me get get familiar with those outtakes because uh, that sounds that sounds uh, really interesting. Me well, too. But, a lot of them yeah. are available on a new HMC two DD DVD set, and a second version, a, a second edition is coming out with two more discs worth. Um, right. Although, although I th- I think the second disc on the second set. Is basically the 1988 laser disc with mm-hmm. a choice of soundtracks. One is the original mono soundtrack. One is the George mm. Martin remix. So, if you're a magical mystery tour nut, you definitely need both of these. <laughs> right, right. Mm. But anyway, but okay. another thing that I'd mm. like to say is that kind of like what they learned in A Hard Day's Night in Help. Every scene was really brief. Mm. I never feel when I'm watching this this film that the movie drags at all. You know, everything is just a couple of minutes. And I, you know, I think the pacing is still, you know, I like it. I, I, I'm not bothered at all by it. You know, little things like uh, seeing um, Aunt Jessie and Buster Blood Vessel on the beach, that romantic scene, mm-hmm. uh, things like that. Certainly the the uh, scene with John as the waiter shoveling up the spaghetti for Aunt Jessie. You know, I love all that stuff. It's mm-hmm. very, um, it's very strange. It's very bizarre, but I like it. It's different in that regard. So, and and it's only an hour. Yeah. So it, it never, I never feel like like it drags. You know, it's I enjoy it mm-hmm. all the way through. And I'm, you know, I can't say I'm not going to compare it to other films because it's not fair to do that because it's a different kind of film. And you talk about it being aimless. It didn't have that much of a plot. <laughs> Sounds like an Everly Brothers song. Um, sort of by definition, again, it didn't. I mean, that was that was sort of the idea, you know. Right. Yeah, but then again, neither did A Hard Day's Night. It was a, a day in the life of the Beatles. A typical crazy day with their fans following them, you know, doing songs on a TV set. Help had a thin plot, but it was a, a bunch of videos strung together with, with uh, dialogue in between. But that doesn't, you know? ju- that doesn't justify... Saying that it's a great film because you know they did this kind of crazy thing, it still has to work. And I think as a loose film, to me, it works. No, I I, I disagree with you. I, I look at many, it as as a different type of film. I don't judge it on the same way that I would the other two films. Well, you have to to a certain extent because it's it's meant to be taken as a whole. It's not meant to be taken separately. I mean. They've, I don't they've know got what all. That means. I don't well, know what that I mean, it's not. It's not meant to be taken as a bunch of music videos. It's not a music video film. But although there are, to... although there are a lot of there are, are a lot of music interludes, but it's it's meant to be taken. It's packaged as a film, as Magical Mystery Tour, and that's why, you know, it, it the 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 plot doesn't work. It just it it has not, and and to say. That they did not try and remaster it to uh, make make uh, history better is is wrong because that's exact because I believe Paul actually says that in one of the comments he makes on the DVD that that's exactly what they were you know they were trying to get people to look at it in a more in a more favorable way and you just well, can't, I don't see you can do that well that's how he feels about it okay you know, well sure of that course he does it. well. Of course he's going to feel that way. You know, I mean, that's part of, you know, as an artist that you're going to try and sell people into believing that it's a better film. But that doesn't mean you have to necessarily agree with it. No, Paul doesn't necessarily have to defend every single thing that that he did in the Beatles or in his solo career. His opinions could change over the years. And apparently he still feels that he's proud of this film. He doesn't have to feel that way. He has a right to feel whichever way he wants to. 
I think he may, I think, he may think he, he could just as easily think that it was a mistake, but he doesn't. I, he wouldn't. He would never think it was a mistake. He would never say it was a mistake. Uh, I, I, I really, I, I just can't see Paul doing that. Paul, Mr. Mr. Public Relations, no, he's not going to do that. Uh, uh, I don't. Yeah. He could. You don't. He, you don't hear him standing behind Broad Street very much. And um, actually, actually, I think Broad Street is a, is a more work, a more interesting film. As bad as Broad Street is, <laughs> I could probably sit through Broad Street a lot easier than I could sit through Magical well, Mystery Tour. Well, it's it's more linear. And Mag- Magical Mystery right. Tour, they were trying to to impose a kind of linear plot on it in the editing, but it didn't really work because they went out... I mean, as one of the early reviews, I think, said they... or, or one of the writers somewhere said that they they went out, you know, to just film whatever happened and nothing happened. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's a little unfair, but, uh, you know, and I should also point out that, you know, I said that when I first saw it, I was disappointed. I mean, now having seen it eight million times, I, I don't know whether it's just that I'm so used to it or whatever. I mean, it, it's less disappointing now. I just think that... Um, you know, I just basically find myself waiting for the clips or fast forwarding to the clips, and I'm, I'm I'm sure that all of us and probably a lot of the listeners um, who are seems weird to say old enough to have VHS and beta machines, um, you know, probably went through all the film releases and made a compilation of just the songs starting from Hard Day's Night and ended mm-hmm. with, with the rooftop, you know, just getting rid of everything in between that wasn't a song. Very nice sequence <laughs> of, of, of mm-hmm. Um And, you know, I did that with Magical Mystery Tour, and, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's great to have a video album, basically, of, of side one, you know. Right, um, right. And but and the other stuff in between, okay, it doesn't take too long, but, I, you know, the thing with the... The picture and he turns into a rabbit or whatever. It, it, it's a, it's uh-huh. a little bit. It's a little bit like you know, kind of you know, a kid's birthday party film. You know, where they do stuff like that. It, it just that wasn't right. that interesting. Um, but there are so many, like I said, so many interesting outtakes that could have you know plus. You know, the traffic clip could could be reinserted. Buster Blood Vessel song could be reinserted because, you know, I think at the time we didn't know that much about Ivor Cutler. But um, since then, he's emerged as a kind of underground comic uh, genius, right. you know. Right. Um, so I think now we'd be much more interested in seeing what else he had to do. And he had a whole song in that film that was cut out. So, you know, otherwise, basically what we have now is the few Beatles songs, the Bonzo dog band doodah dog band song, um, yeah. and the rest is, you know, like the instrumental version of All My Lovin' and, and, and you know, score music, but... It could have been a much more, much more of a variety show if they left in Ivor Cutler and Traffic and, you know, who knows, mm-hmm. and Jesse Drumming. I mean, it, it's, I, I think there is a lot of potential in all the film that was filmed for Magical Mystery Tour. And mm-hmm. the, they did not make the best possible film that you could make with that material. And mm-hmm. that's why I think well, that there Paul may should be, be there, there may be people who think otherwise, that if they added more, it would be even, more boring. Even more intolerable. <laughs> yeah, it's very yeah. possible. Mm-hmm. I also look at the fact that um, I, I do believe, it's all, like I've said, it's all one family uh, when it comes to the, the comedy, the British comedy. The Beatles are influenced by the goons. Um, and I could see... Uh, Monty Python being influenced by the Beatles and the Goons, because there are times when, in particular, if you watch when the Beatles and all the cast of characters on the bus are on this big open field, and then there's this small tent that they all enter, and then that leads into a room where they're watching, uh, you know, the the film of Blue Jay Way. Right. I mean, that's that's surreal. Mm-hmm. And yet that's the kind of thing that Monty Python would do all the time on their TV show or someone like Benny Hill. So, you know, I look at a, a film like this and I do think that it was somewhat influential in that regard. OK, um, let's also since we're running and getting close to an hour, um, let's talk a little bit about the album itself 
And my feeling, and it was released as you know, as you guys know, as everyone knows, in two different versions. It was released in England as a, a double EP with the booklet, and then in America it was released as a full album with the Magical Mystery Tour songs on one side and um, a bunch of other songs uh, on the other side. And I think this is one time Capital got it right. Uh, I think yeah. the, because especially since uh, Parlophone eventually did what Capital did. So um, I know the mix may not be exactly correct, but it, the format with the with what the Beatles uh, with what uh, Capital did was was the correct thing to do. Um, I think. Um, yeah, because, Alan, because unlike, say, the Hey Jude album or the Beatles again, depending which way you look at the title of that album, you know, that was a hodgepodge of stuff from all through their career that didn't happen to get on an album. And so here it is. But with Magical Mystery Tour, the stuff on side two was basically all from the same period. You know, right. we're we're talking about 1967 stuff, and so it made sense as an album. And you know, even though it 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 violated in a huge way that Beatles rule about singles not being on albums, um, in the U.S. that rule wasn't really applied anyway, um, right? Up until Pepper, and uh, you know, we I think collected things differently we kind of wanted them on an album even if we had them on a single we wanted them on an album we wanted them in stereo and magical mystery tour was the last album to come out in mono in the u.s and they were very hard to find when it was new i mean i remember that because in fact i think at that time i had a mono turntable and I was looking for a mono and you'd go through like 50 stereos before you finally found a mono. Oh, I don't know. That wasn't true for me. I, when I, I think at the time I was in uh, Boston and it, it was, they were really easy to find, hmm. but that's my, that was my, in fact, I'm, I'm almost positive. My first copy was mono. So yeah, mine was, um, it, E.J. Corvettes, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> can't remember. I can't remember the name of the store, but uh, but I re- I'm pretty sure it was Mono. Yeah, but, but I, I remember the stereo being much more plentiful, and, and and it wasn't long before I ended up going out and getting the stereo anyway. And then that was another thing because on on you know some of the stuff on the B side of the album was kind of reprocessed because mm-hmm. they didn't have stereo mixes yet. And uh, over the years, I think they replaced a few of them. But the big revelation was when I went and got the German one. And it had Baby right. You're a Rich Man, not only in stereo, but the bass on that was immensely different than the you know yeah. tinny mono cool. sound that we had. And uh, I remember having one of my editors over for dinner um, who was basically a, a classical music guy. Um, and we were talking about the differences mainly in classical pressings between European and American ones. European ones we generally regarded as superior. And I said, oh, yeah, well, you know, you want to hear a difference, listen to this. And I play Baby or a Rich Man in both the U.S. version and the German version, and he just fell out of his seat. It was so different. Mm. So, yeah. Was it? Uh, the, it's just that the bass was hotter? That was the main thing? Well, on, on the American one, you barely hear the bass at all by comparison, whereas the German one, it's like, especially like that first drop of an octave, um, it's, it is way down there, a lot of you know, bass energy, plus the track was in stereo. And mm. it was in mono on the U.S. one, or reprocessed. That's what I remember is the stereo. Um, that was the. I think that was the. I don't remember the bass part, but I do remember the, the stereo, and that was the reason why I picked it up was for that reason. Uh, but in any event, go ahead. Um, yeah, no, I'm done. So over to Ken or one of you guys. <laughs> well, I'm only used to to the to the. Um, the way that it came out with uh, the two sides on an album, and I've always been happy with it. And the music's phenomenal, and we all know that. And, uh, you know, it was great to have all the, the singles and the B-sides on, on the second side of the album. I thought it was very <laughs> clever to do that, to collect it all together. Very much what Alan said, unlike, you know, Hey Jude, at least this made sense because it was all from that same year. So right. it was nice to have the A-sides and B-sides, to have Baby or Rich Men on there. It was very cool. You yeah. know. 
and it was funny that it, that the, the Brits actually, I wasn't expecting them to to do that, and it was it was funny that they finally um, they finally did it. I don't remember. It was several years after, as I recall. It wasn't right away, but I also remember that the the double EPs were not easy to find here. You remember that, Alan? Oh Whether yeah, they, they were, were only in. Yeah, I mean, obviously you had to get it at an import shop, and right, you know, those were. Yeah, they 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 were hard to find. I, I ended up getting one, but it, I don't think it was until the early seventies. Yeah, same here. I don't remember. I didn't, I'm pretty sure I didn't get one right away. But um, yeah, I think the That's, EP was out in stereo and mono too, right? I think I think we eventually had to find two versions of that. Am I wrong about that? No, I think I think you're wrong about that one. I think huh. it was only yeah, I think it was only in uh, out one way. Huh. I'm, I I don't remember for sure though. Memory seems to, because they um, because the songs were divided across the the two EPs. Right, but, um, but there wasn't a stereo edition and a mono edition. Oh, you may be right. For some reason, yeah, I thought there was. But maybe if if somebody if somebody from England is listening, they can fill us in on that one. Um, but yeah, I'm pretty sure that it would. They only came out one way. They didn't issue dupl- you know double packages on that one. Yeah, but in any event, I do remember one thing about the album, though, about the Capitol album, is that book never stayed in the album. It was always it would invariably it would come loose from the the binding of the album and 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 the and the uh, the pa- the pages that with the pictures would fall out. Mine is didn't. that you guys? Yours didn't really. I took care I, of mine, I, Steve. I, oh hush. <laughs> I remember. I saw so many. I've seen so many that have had you know loose pages and everything. It's been ridiculous. But anyway, all right. Any other comments about Magic Mystery Tour you guys want to make? It's a great album. That's it. You know. It's, uh, it's, <laughs> yeah, I mean that. That's the funny part. I mean, we we complained about the the movie, but you the, two we, did. <laughs> the, but the uh, the album itself, you know, those songs for the movie were were great. I'm I'm glad I finally got to see Blue Jay Way um a couple of years ago. Thanks to uh Jillian Lomax. Jillian if you're listening, thank you. But uh yeah, I finally got to see Blue Jay Way in Los Angeles and that's a very steep drive, uh I remember. Hmm. But uh, it's uh if you ever uh are in Los Angeles, um it's worth hunting out where Blue Jay Way is. Um but anyway, Okay. Uh, yeah. Anybody? Well, anybody well, else have anything else to say? Yeah. Can't? Sometimes we never bring it up, but um, there's a band that's been around for a long time called Death Cab for Cutie, mm-hmm. and they got their name right. from the song from the Bonzo Dog Band. Well, actually, from, we should we should we should talk about the Bonzos real quick because that is um, very much. I mean, that's where a lot of us saw them for the first time, and of course, Neil Ennis was part of that group. Uh, and you know, and uh, I mean, they were great in that movie. And I purchased several of their albums on vinyl after that. I think I have, I have the the CD compilation that has, I think, all their stuff. Um, but that first album uh, where they where um, oh god, now Graham Chapman sings uh, does that demented version of "I Left My Heart in San Francisco." That's just a, a wonderful, wonderful album. Wonderful album. Um, huh. And of course, you got the song "I'm the Urban Spaceman." Right, it's Paul and right. right. So, but yeah, that's uh, they were. Uh, yeah, I, I, we really can't not mention them. Uh, we're, we're, I mean, we're talking about when you're talking about British humor in Magical Mystery Tour. You know, it really kind of parallels what Bon, what the Bonzos did. I mean, the Bonzos were doing some some great stuff, some great crazy stuff. And I don't know if you had to, and I, this is probably an unfair comparison, but the quality of what the Bonzos did overall, I think, is better than what the Beatles did in Magical Mystery Tour. And, and maybe that's an unfair comparison, uh, but I mean, the Bonzo stuff was fantastic; it was it was absolutely brilliant. So, anybody want you want to say anybody want to say anything about the Bonzos? Uh, well, I'm not too familiar with their catalog, but you know, I just think sometimes you spend too much time making comparisons, Steve. Ken, I mean, Alan. Uh, no, right. other than that, in the uh, in the um, 
HMC versions of uh, Magical Mystery Tour uh, using the outtakes and raw footage, um, you see all of Jan the Stripper. There's no black bar. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a lot of Bonzo stuff in those outtakes? No, it's it's just that. It's just, just the, uh, the one song they, they, they had. I'm, I'm not mm. sure if there were outtakes of the song or not. I, something tells me there was actually some alternate footage um but i don't really remember that clearly i think there i think there was some alternate footage so maybe there was another take okay all right I, gentlemen i think uh, unless we have forgotten anything we have about uh run out of time let me we uh, did we did forget one thing what did we forget we never talked about paul in australia didn't we well, I'll just mention it really quick. Um, we were going to mention, by the way, in the news segment that Paul uh, played uh, in Australia and he played Mull of Kintyre. And another reason for me to complain that he's not playing it in America. So there we go. So uh, we're going to wrap up here. Let's start with Ken uh, and Alan, and they will quickly tell you where to get a hold of themselves. Ken, you first. Uh, my email address is everylittlething at att.net. My website is kenmichaelsradio.com. I will be doing a new special contest by the end of this week to win the brand new uh, biography on Roy Orbison, which is called The Authorized Roy Orbison. And it was written by three of Roy's sons, Roy Jr., Wesley, and Alex, and also our good friend Jeff Slate, who we know for being a writer for... Beatle fan and Esquire and Rolling Stone and um, having his band called Birds of Paradox, who performs at the Fest for Beatle fans. And so I have a couple of copies of that that I'll be giving away in a special contest, which will start Friday or Saturday. And uh, a few days ago, I had the chance to interview Alex Orbison, one of uh, Roy's sons. And that interview will be on my website very soon. Quite a lot of talking about Roy's time with the Beatles when they toured together in the UK, what Roy told his son, and what uh, Alex found out from the people who worked with Roy, and also quite a bit on the Traveling Wilburys too, and then the rest of Roy Orbison's career. So that'll be on my website uh, probably the same time, Friday or Saturday of this week. That's at KenMichaelsRadio.com. All right. Thank you, Ken. Alan? Uh, you can find me at um, Facebook under Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. I don't have any contests. I'm not giving anything away. <laughs> <laughs> and you can find me uh, at, at BeatlesExaminer at gmail.com. And my Beatles uh, Facebook group is Beatles News and Information, um, which I talked about earlier. And if you're looking for a very cheap Christmas gift, I have an ebook called Meet a Monkey, Davy Jones that um, uh, I have my two interviews with Davy Jones and also a review of the last tour he did with Mickey Dolenz and Peter Tork. That's about it for this week, folks. We will be back next week with who knows what we'll be talking about, uh, you know, anything from here to the moon. But uh, we hope you will join us for Ken Michaels and Alan Cozen. This is Steve Marinucci saying thanks for listening and come back and visit us again. Mm-hmm.